A lot of people dream about traveling all around the world, but our next guest wanted to do it on a sailboat and alone. <laughs> Dave Rierick finally got the opportunity at age 55. He is a carpenter by day and a sailor the rest of the time. He wrote about his experiences in this book. It's Spirit of a Dream, a sailor's ultimate journey around the world alone. So good to have you here. Thanks for having me. Big yeah. Nice to you. you really went all the way around the world. I did, and I, I can verify it's round. Uh, <laughs> You are not a flat earther. I'm not a flat earther. No, I'm not. Yeah. How many days does it take to go around the world? Well, obviously, on a it depends sailboat. on what you're doing, but I was trying to mimic a race that I had planned on racing that had gotten canceled. So um, it was about 156 days of sailing over the course of eight and a half months. I had a stop in Cape Town, South Africa, New Zealand, and then for personal reasons, I had to divert from the original course around Cape Horn. I went to Galapagos, to the Panama Canal, and back to Newport, Rhode Island, where I started from. Yeah. Okay, so here's wow. what I'm fascinated to know is um, why alone? Because I think that sounds horrible and scary, but I wonder <laughs> if um, it's more about the challenge of it. Uh, certainly, a lot of it's about the challenge. Um, it came to me when I was probably, I, I started sailing I'm from the southern shores of Lake Michigan in Indiana, so I started sailing about age 12 on a sunfish and would sneak books out of the library at school because, you know, young boys weren't supposed to take books out of the library in school, but I would sneak the sailing stories and I read about these guys who sailed single-handed across the Atlantic and so like that. And it was recent history that Robin Knox Johnson had just been the first man to sail single-handed around the world nonstop. And I got fascinated with it and, and just held on to that dream all my life until I got the chance to do it. Wow. Uh, did you have modern technology to be able to communicate with people if something went wrong? <clears throat> I did. I had a satellite phone mm -hmm. on board, which I also used to uplink to the Internet to pull down weather information. Okay. We had computers. We've got uh, GPS navigation. So we've got a lot of advantages that they didn't have 30 or 50 or 100 years ago. Yeah. Good for yeah. safety, though. Yeah, good for safety. But still, you know, once you're more than 1,000 miles offshore, actually more than 700 miles offshore, you're really at the mercy of, of luck being saved if something goes wrong. Um, I, I look at that. It yeah. doesn't look big enough to make it. I don't <laughs> I know. know. <laughs> it looks well, the boat was specifically designed and built for this particular type of thing. It's called a Class 40 boat, and it's, okay. it's designed very strong to be uh, sailed single-handed or double-handed across the oceans in races and stuff like that. Okay, so, so it's, it's yeah. a video. Oh, gorgeous pictures, by the way. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. So Thank I you. love what you said about becoming closer and more in touch with the ocean, nature, yeah. and this amazing universe. I want to ask you some environmental questions. But first, I, I think about the thing that Einstein said about there are only two ways to live your life. And one is as if nothing is a miracle or as though everything is a miracle. And I wonder if you're one or the other. I, I fall into the everything's a miracle. Um, there's just so many amazing things out there, and, and I, I think when you spend uh, an inordinate amount of time uh, um, embedded in nature as closely as I was, you kind of get a sense of there's some real wild, uh, not wild, but real interesting things happening in the world that are just amazingly beautiful, whether it's a sunset or you know glowing orbs in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm a everything's a miracle type person. Wow. Did cool. you have any close calls or, or touches with death? Well, you know, I'm <laughs> close as a matter of perspective, I guess. Uh, I, I, in my book, I mentioned that my, my entire life is a near miss, and I'm only here because of other people's near misses in previous generations. So there were uh, three or four events in the trip around the world that were, were rather edgy. Mm -hmm. um, I have good friends that think leaving the dock is rather edgy. So <laughs> I'm one of those. I know, me too. Yeah. You clearly don't get motion sick. No, no, I don't. Okay. I don't. Yeah, you're fortunate as <laughs> a sailor about I have, that. I, I have been seasick a couple of times, but, uh, you know, but not very often. Okay. Uh, you, you, you touch on um, plastic pollution, mm -hmm. fascinating, as well as climate change in the oceans. You said you saw plastic everywhere, even the most remote spots of the world. Um, you spend time now with students, I know, and you talk to people, um, educate people. Um, but you talk about this importance of thinking and acting for sustainability, the environment, and the earth. And we kind of joked about our, mm -hmm. you know, metal not straws. plastic straws, our metal straws. I noticed your metal straws. <laughs> yeah. 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 Saving the turtles yeah. one straw at a time. But just your, I, I know it's a big topic, yeah. but your thoughts on this, because I think that's so important. I mean, we've got a president who's kind of not saying um, publicly, he's not sure about global warming and some, some. what did you see? Yeah. You know, I, uh, uh, one of the most amazing, I mean, I saw plastic in every part of the world, in every part of the ocean. There were, there were certain places where I saw plastic in every, you know, I was, this piece would pass and another piece would be mm -hmm. right in front of me. Um, in the more remote oceans, I might see one or two pieces a day. There might be a five-gallon bucket adrift mm -hmm. in the middle, you know, 
3,000 miles from land or whatever. So plastic's everywhere. And, but um, you know, one of the most amazing things is on the trip around, I stopped in New Zealand where the boat was built and we went and toured the Fox Glacier. Got, you know, did a hike up onto it with crampons and poles and all stuff. And I was just back there this spring, five years from now, and the glacier's gone. Mm. It's melted away, it's gone. So it's a, it is happening, it is, it is going on in the world. And it's, um, you know, when I work with the students at, uh, and I'm an ambassador for 11th Hour Racing, and I work with the Chicago Maritime Arts Center down in Chicago with these young kids, we get them to the water and teach them about things. I just try to encourage people to be sustainable about their way in life. Not, you can't do it 100%, but to just do something Mm -hmm. A little bit here and there helps uh, in the whole process, and it's just a good way to, to think about, you know, living in nature and taking care of our world. I feel like we could literally speak to you for hours and hours. The things that you've experienced and seen, um, people can get a, a, in contact with you at your book signing. It's going on Wednesday, September 4th. It's at 7 o'clock. It's at Boswell Book Company on Downer. Spiritofadream.com is the book, and you can get a copy at that website as well. Thank you so and much. And it'd be great because I can get you around the world in about 30 minutes without getting cold, wet, and <laughs> I like that. I don't like being cold. <laughs> yeah. Were you lonely? Um, you know, not necessarily, but there were a couple of moments where loneliness began. And I'll let somebody read the book to find those moments okay. out. So I it's like kind of it. it's kind of it's kind of fun. Great to meet you. Likewise. Yeah, thank Thanks you. for having me. I really appreciate it. What a trip. It. Thanks, Thanks. again.